future that uh, Gandhi talked about comes true. We have vaccines for everything, and we can truly prevent all the diseases from happening. Until the time that happens, our only hope is that we detect the disease early, and that too is a hope that if we detect it early, we can do something about it. Now that's not always true. Even if you find some things early, there's nothing you can do about it, because we have no good drugs for it. But nevertheless, assuming until the time we have a vision, when things are truly preventable from birth or later, we would try to use the power of a more digital world in trying to find things early, and that's what I will talk about today. I want to use three terms here at the very beginning, because they get confused very commonly. Digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. Now, in a hospital, when you start scanning all your animal data and digitizing it, you gain something. One, the data cannot be destroyed as easily. Two, it's accessible for a variety of analysis. But the, really, the function of the hospital may not necessarily change. Now, if you go to the next step, not simply of scanning and converting analog things to digital formats, but of truly connecting things. Every instrument from the time it is working is made in data in digital format. Everything is on a network, everything is accessible, everything talks to each other. Then you are at digitalization. Today with your mobile phones, your use of your bank accounts, your payments, you are living in a digitalized world. But the next step, the hardest step, is digital transformation. In digital transformation, not only is everything digitalized, but it's also being used to maintain the maximum amount of efficiency. So in this vision, if you truly had a system, very, I'm sorry, let me just figure this one out. Okay. In this system, the digital world is there, but everything is separate. If this with everything unified <coughs> data, that you could access even genomic diagnostics in a primary health care center, everything is digital, all data is moving. A digitally fluid society is digitally transformed. Now, what kind of a society would it be if we truly had digital transformation? And you can think of it as three levels. The first level is that of digital humans. If you think of your genetic code, it's a digital format. You could imagine this scenario, this is already happening in some parts of the world, where the digital blueprint of your life could be known at birth. UK is already talking about sequencing every newborn. And the next level is what we call digital drugs. It's a very interesting concept, where from the time somebody is born, not only you know their genomes, but you're adding on multiple layers of information in this digitalized world. So you would basically be getting every event that happens to the person. You would be wearing a number of sensors, adding data, multiple layers of information. In this sense, you would have one existence of yourself in a real world and one existence of your digital world in the virtual world. The algorithms, the efficiencies would come by continuous action on your digital world. And any necessary action that needs to be taken would cross over into the real world. To do that, you need to have digital lives. And this is something that the generation that is growing up, a true digitally native generation is already starting to see. Apart from your existence in the real world, you have a digital avatar. The digital avatar interacts with your friends, interacts with your doctors in the foreseeable future. You are totally immersed in a digital system. Interactions will get more and more virtual. And the last level would then be enabled by both of these together will be digital care. Today, we have a concept of you go and see a doctor. You decide when you feel ill and you walk over to see a doctor. There is a very interesting concept of doctors coming to see patients, not necessarily in the physical world, but in the virtual world. And for that, you would enable a type of medicine that is both predictive, personalized, preventive, and participatory. I'm going to talk mostly about this last part in this slide, participatory. Unless a very large number of people are participating, providing their data, providing the systems on which the algorithms will be built, 
this will never be realized. It has to be predicted. That's the entire point. It needs to be personalized. I mean, the number needed to treat for almost every healthcare interactions to get benefit are very large. We know that people respond very, very differently. And the last piece that has been added recently is psychocognitive that we will not talk about today. So in this multi-omic view of personalized medicine, that will be enabled by digital transformation. You could think of us as sets of data, multiple layers. The epigenome, the transcriptome, the proteome, the metabolome, and most recently the microbiome. In a very nice work done in Israel, it was seen that there is no perfect diet. After feeding people 50,000 standardized diet to more than 200 people over a course of a couple of years, they realized there was no particular diet that leads to the best glycemic response. Unless we actually look at the bacteria inside people, at the same time look at their genomes, you cannot predict which food suits which people. So these multiple layers would have to come together to create this next generation of medicine. And in this kind of a world, you'll be looking at health in the lens of data. And what's that? You can only draw three dimensions, but if you imagine every possible variable in healthcare as a dimension, then people would look like this, moving through space of this multiple dimensions of health data in ways that could be, you could imagine something like diseased and healthy. That's possible but not very likely. You could imagine something like this where there's a phase, people transfer to this side and they become diseased. You could imagine a world where people have multiple trajectories, but there are few attractor states, metastable states, in which disease exists. The point is, unless these trajectories are measured for a very large number of people over a very large period of time, it would not be possible to say and properly predict who is the person who is likely to develop disease anytime soon. Now, there are two possible visions to this. One is the system is too complex. If the system is indeed too complex and there are no such trajectories, there are no such attractive states, then precision medicine cannot exist. But for the sake of today's discussion, let us assume that this is indeed true. Then the point really becomes what are the various elements of data that one needs to measure and how one will go about measuring it. And one thing that will come obviously to your mind is that at some point all this data will cross the limits of the human. And that is something that the New England Journal of Medicine talked about a couple of years ago when it pointed out that medical knowledge is expanding rapidly, very rapidly. And there's a tremendous amount of dissatisfaction. People are expecting more and more. And we are delivering compared to expectations less and less. And one of the biggest problems in this is that there are advances in immunology, genetics, system biology, patients are older, more illnesses, and all of this is leading to the fact that we are providing far less benefit to people than we hope. And if the problem is complexity, the solutions are very unlikely to be seen. So I think there is a time for a fundamental paradigm change in the future of healthcare, with a classical system of doctors having the entire body of knowledge inside their heads, being able to tell an individual patient based on their experience where the things are likely to go, is simply not going to be relevant anymore. But if that system is not going to be relevant anymore, what is the next system going to be? In the conventional system, we made efficient use of limited data of different degrees of certainty. In this system, we depended very highly upon prior knowledge and experience. In this system, health experts used logic to develop how the particular patient should be treated. And this system had its own source of errors, which any new system will have a different source of errors, but what will a new system be like? It must use large and complex data. It will almost necessarily have to be highly dependent upon algorithms. And very importantly, it will need machines that can learn from the data. Now this last part, the artificial intelligence part, will be covered by Manish in his talk. So I won't spend much time on this. I will focus mostly on these two parts. And when I say this, I will say one more thing. Before you have AI, you need two other combinations of the same letters. II and IA. 
IR is intelligence augmentation, intelligent infrastructure. AI is possible today because you already had the digital transformation in the IT spheres. In countries like India, this part is still going to be very, very important. You have to first build the infrastructure on which you build all these other areas. And the second part is intelligence augmentation. This can be thought of as more declarative types of AI where you kind of know where you need to go. You don't have to have the machines learn, you need to direct the machines to assist people in decision support. And I will take one example only here to illustrate what is possible today. <coughs> there is a case study of the in the Indian Journal from October of this year. A patient was diagnosed in 2016 with intractable seizures. By February of that year, the patient was appropriately referred for genetic medicine. By March, they had a mutation diagnosed, and this was done by whole genome sequencing. Another two months, they had a cell line established on the patient. Another two months, they identified the spliced effect created by the mutation. Another six months, they had developed antisense oligonucleotide to target that specific splicing defect for that particular patient. Another six months, well, three months actually, you already had them tested in in, vivo, in vitro models of primary cells from the patient as well as rat studies. And by 2018, starting in 2016, you had the first patient losing. In what other part of human history can you imagine this being enabled? Quick clinical diagnosis, massive amounts of data, a whole genome being sequenced, 3.5 billion bases. Proper standard classical molecular biology, all working in concept. And this is basically what it was, a 14 base pair target site application, led to a normal splicing, led to a stop being inserted. Ultimately, you can see patient fibroblast over here, oligonucleotides being given, and you can see reversal of the disease pattern in two years. But this is not the limit of where we can go. A lot of this was still man driven. The whole genome sequencing is already incorporates a lot of AI and IA and IR. But it can go even faster. Can this be done in a month? The process of generation of lines interpretation can all be put on massively parallel scales. It will be done. The question then to my mind is this is possible in America, where a person can go from a primary genetic disease to an individualized one person therapy, the true N of one trial that we all talk about. This is reality. <coughs> But how will this happen in India? And does India need it? This is a very famous cover page from one of my colleagues, Dr. Thangarai from CCMB, showing that Indians carry a very large number of deleterious genetic mutations. And not only do we carry a large burden, we are also very inbred. In fact, the typical Indian sub-community is more inbred than Ashkenazi Jews and Finns, giving us a very high burden of people whose parents are similar to each other and therefore they carry double copies of these mutations. So if you want to look at a country that needs better quality genomics and therapies, you are here. In our own experience, take something, a disease as simple as spinal cellular ataxia, very well studied across the world. Until the 2000s, people discovered new types of spinal cellular ataxia by looking at Indian patients. Over 20 years of work between All India Institute and our institute, we've discovered many new types of SCS. We converted them into targeted panels, affordable diagnostic. We converted them into primary stem cells, induced to important stem cells. When a new drug got diagnosed, well, synthesized by University of Wisconsin, <coughs> for actually Friedrich's ataxia, type of these ataxias, we are actually able to use the IPSCs derived from these patients efficiently screen that drug and show that it actually works. So the technology, the different elements do exist in our country. And if we want to imagine the future of healthcare over here, the elements and the bits and the pieces are here. We need to put them together. So in one vision, you need to have something like this. You need to have multiple patients across the country referring cases of genetic disorders. You need to be processing them through discovery platforms. We need to be converting them into panels relevant to countries, make them out there accessible again. 
You need to educate clinicians in terms of diagnosis. It takes about seven years for a person with a real genetic disorder to get a diagnosis. And then you need to convert them back into tests for the community. Now how can digital transformation aid in any of these or all of these? One possible vision is you need to create massive databases of genetic data. And a step was made by us in which we collected along with CCMB 1000 whole genome sequence cases around the country. Most variations in the world are not pathogenic, only a few variations are pathogenic. Many pathogenic variants are unknown. Using a combination of high quality databases, continuous inferencing, and these are very, very private data. So you need to build data architecture models, and we were talking about that in the way here, federated learning. Data does not move algorithms. <coughs> these kinds of databases, new kind of data architectures need to be created to create the most efficient way of mining through these billions of pieces of data. You need to create applications, and this is something that was built recently. It's called the indigen. Every person with a genome would almost have a card. But today, you don't know all the possible interpretations of the same genome. So a person does not have a diagnosis. They only have a code that links them to a web platform. The actual diagnosis may run. If a patient scans this code, they will get the most updated interpretations. If a clinician scans the same code, they will get a different type of with evidence interpretations. But importantly, you need platforms like EDA. EDA is probably at this point the number one medical reasoning engine in the world. And these are the kind of reviews it is getting. It's available for download in India. There are millions of users in India of this app. You simply enter your symptoms. It will ask you more and more questions, just like a physician would. And in the end, it will give you a possible list of diagnoses that you might be having. Now, to enable this in India more effectively, what do you need? You need better priors. You need better public health data. You need better user interfaces. You could talk about making this in Hindi, but not everybody who is Hindi is literate in terms of being able to read Hindi. You need natural language processing, and you need to make sure this is all coupled at the back end to make sure that people get appropriate referrals from inside their homes as opposed to visiting doctors for every small thing. So a combination of genomics, AI, data, better use case scenarios, better platforms is what is required to drive the future. So are we doing this? <coughs> India has a precision health national mission now. The idea is to serve, to save and to earn. To provide a platform for affordable emerging health tech services. To generate, that's the self part. To generate the necessary data to seed the ecosystem. To create companies within India providing these services. And in the end, to create necessary competencies for global services. With a country of a billion people, our biggest resource is human. And we have lots of natural experiments in this area. We could use it to move stride. Key considerations in this that will be talked about by Dr. Reddy uh, later on. What is the idea of all this? Like I said, not all futures are good, not all futures are better than previous, the past. The idea should be to improve lives, not just not <coughs> You have to look at a variety of elements of equity and inclusion, and you have to worry a lot regarding how this data will be used. And there is a need for academia to lead this transformation, and I hope Rajesh will talk about that a bit. And governing health futures 2030, it's a topic in itself that <coughs> merits a great degree of debate. And in the end, I'll talk, I'll end my part of the talk by simply pointing out that while I'm very, very enthusiastic about the future, I'm very enthusiastic about the power of emerging technologies, of data, of AI, I still remain happiest if there is a vaccine that will actually prevent something like this, prevent the burden of disease as opposed to simply focus on the diagnosis. But I'm also very conscious the maximum money that will flow into healthcare systems of tomorrow will be in the area that I talked about. The money will flow simply because this is where there's also money to be made. And for that reason alone, I would warn you also of this. You must imagine not only what is possible with the emerging tech, you must also imagine what is broken and actually needs fixing. Otherwise, you have the classical hammer and nail problem. Thank you. I invite Manish to give the next part of the talk. Thank you.